Off top in 1942, Franklin Delano Roosevelt proposed a maximum wage of $25,000. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. All right, welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. I am Dominique Foxworth, joined as always by the great Charlie Kravitz. I've been annoyed a little bit lately about some of this quarterback Mm. conversation. Some of it takes place in our group chats. Some of it takes place on the internet. And I just get frustrated by people pretending like there's a conversation about whether to pay the quarterbacks or not. And I think most smart football people recognize that there is no debate about the Dak Prescott situation. You kind of got to pay Dak, given how much leverage he has, how good they were, or how good they are, how talented the rest of the roster is. Right now, that's moved to the side. I don't think anybody is serious about saying don't pay Dak. I think the same thing is probably true about Jordan Love. It's a question of how much or how long the contract, but people generally feel like Jordan Love needs to get paid. But when you get down to the guys like Tua, and that's the one that stands out to me because there's no question about the guys like Zach Wilson. Not a good quarterback. We're not going to extend him. Those guys, Sam Darnold, guys like that. Well, I'm only saying Jets. Uh, <laughs> Mac Jones. Rosen. Yeah, DeRo- or yeah, Rosen. Uh, Josh Rosen. Josh Jones. Rosen. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, DeMar DeRozan. Pay him. He can hoop out in Sacramento. But um, those guys in down, I get it. You don't pay them. But there's this, like, middle, which actually isn't a middle. It's probably, like, closer to a B-level quarterback. It's not like an average quarterback. They're slightly above average. They're competent starters. That's the question. And what frustrates me is we – or annoys me, I guess, is we often listen to people talk about the argument of whether they should pay them or not. And it feels silly because the team has already made the decision or at least boxed themselves into having to pay the players. There's no other option at this point for these guys because the strategy that they're going about using is one where you're trying to win with a quarterback on a rookie deal. And if you follow that strategy, the point is you're not heavily invested in the quarterback position. So you're using every resource you have to build up around this particular quarterback. And those resources have got your quarterback to B level. And now you're like, what decision do we make? We have no other option because you have a roster that feels like it's ready to win now and no move at quarterback. Like I'd be comfortable. I think it'd be stupid if you move on from your quarterback at this point. I think that's true of Tua. Uh, It's true of, I mean, we can go down the list of other quarterbacks like that through history where uh, Joe Flacco is an example where you could argue it didn't work out, but like you have to pay him coming off of the Super Bowl. I guess it's a bad example because they won the Super Bowl. Who are some other mediocre? Oh, Andy Dalton. You kind of have to pay Andy Dalton given the situation that he's in. But there's another strategy to take and no one's going to take it, but you can't pretend like there's an actual conversation to be had around the quarterback if no one takes the strategy. And the strategy would be to try to stream quarterbacks and prepare for life after because the probability of how good your quarterback will be versus how good the quarterback you acquire is going to be is too scary for people to take that risk which is why you need to continue to invest in that position until you find someone that you're comfortable transitioning to at a lower price but if you're going from a guy that you know can give you b work chances of you finding someone else in the draft or free agent at the price that you want that can give you that also are so low, which is why you need to continue to invest. So I guess there's really no way around investing in that position. It's just no one chooses to invest in it in any other way than trying to win on your rookie deal, trying to create a great quarterback, realizing your quarterback is just good, and then paying him, right? I guess. I mean, you can try and upgrade. The The Rams tried to upgrade from Goff to Stafford right. at a time like that. There are, there are other ways around it. So the Rams... Did upgrade, and I guess that's a different strategy, but yeah, that's not one another that's, strategy. Yeah, that's not one that's often available, and that's still continuing along the same strategy, right? Like it's not the strategy was they paid Jared Goff. They didn't cut Jared Goff and acquire someone else. Yeah, they I, paid Jared Goff and then traded him. Realized that they yeah. thought he was a B quarterback and yeah. needed to become needed an A to win with the team that they had. And then he became an A somewhere else, and then I think Carson Wentz is another example of they paid the guy and then went and looked for another quarterback in the draft. 
I guess, I don't know, maybe it's not as frustrating and annoying as it seems to me, or maybe it's more obvious to everyone else than it feels like it is to me, but it, it just seems silly that we have these conversations every offseason. There's a new quarterback. Every other offseason, there's a new quarterback. We did it with Dak a few years ago, which was stupid. We're doing it again with Dak now, which is stupid, but every there are some that I understand the conversation, and Tua represents that right now. So, I want to spin this forward a tiny bit. Okay. Because I, I the Dak one, I feel like we're we're fighting ESPN ghosts that there's yeah, like a concept yeah. of people saying that he's not good enough to be there paid were, or should or shouldn't be paid. There were people last time around that were doing it. I thought yeah, anyway. he had come off. He waited until he had his massive ankle injury yeah. and then got Jerry Jones still took care of him. He was, he was a younger player, um, and he was going to get paid. But part of this, and I'm not trying to flatten your argument, mm-hmm. is that good quarterbacks end up deserving those contracts. So most of them are easy. No one right. like. You can go through the way that the Chiefs had to change their strategy for signing Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. They had to trade Tyreek Hill. They had to hit on all their picks. They would do that again in a cocaine heartbeat because it is extending maybe the best quarterback of all time, top three quarterback in NFL history, and he's still in his 20s. The Bills would always extend Josh Allen again. The Bengals, even with the injuries, wouldn't think twice about Joe Burrow. I think the the moment, the inflection point, which really effed all of this up, in my opinion, was the talk about Lamar Jackson's contract last year. Because that's someone who is an MVP who has been, I, I don't know how you want to tear the quarterbacks, one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. Is that is that a fair way yeah, to put it without absolutely. being too descriptive? And that became a, a referendum on should the Ravens pay him? I actually think that's a, an oversimplification of what happened last year. Right. Last year, the market was yeah. messed up because of the worst contract in NFL history given to Deshaun Watson. And Lamar Jackson is like, I'm better than that guy. I want all that guaranteed money. He didn't have traditional uh, representation of yeah. communicating with the press. So the inner workings of that, the intricacies of that weren't expressed in a way that if you had someone from CAA or someone mm-hmm. leaking to NFL reporters saying this is going to happen, it's all going to get worked out. And it did get worked out. And he ended up with a, con- a contract commensurate with the other elite quarterbacks in the NFL at that at that stage. But when it comes to guys like Tua, mm-hmm. and I think we should get into Brock Purdy a tiny bit, even though Ooh, it's in 2025 I can't coming. Wait. I can't wait for someone Brock like Purdy. Tua is really interesting because he is someone who's been incredibly injury prone. Mm-hmm. And I don't want this to be a referendum on him. It's just the yeah, concept no, of this. Yeah. Who has put up insane numbers. Mm-hmm. Like numbers that at a point last year he was the MVP favorite, I think after like week four or five, but doesn't seem like he has been a great quarterback unless he's in the system from Mike McDaniel. And if you you say they need to pay Tua, they're barely a playoff team. I think that of of all the quarterbacks you've named, like, yeah, he's likely to be a Joe Flacco situation where because of his injury history, because of his lack of physical tools, his best football might be behind him. And that's the scary thing about extensions in football. They're paying for, you're paying for the next contract, not the previous one, because nothing is, doesn't feel right. like the NBA where past performance is indicative of what's coming. I think that's fair. And I think you said you don't want to make this specifically about Tua, but you brought up the the things that are specific to his situation. Yeah. So it is, <laughs> I just did. I yeah. totally contradicted myself. So it is, it is specific to Tua. So we can do both of them. We can yeah. do not specific to Tua and specific to Tua. So I think the result is still the same. And unless you think, and this is a question that I know you, you've asked, you've brought up before, yeah. is unless you think you can do it again or you're ready to go into a complete rebuild. You keep Tua. And the assumption that Mike McDaniel made Tua is a sticky one for me because I get it. However, you could also argue that the previous regime broke him. It's not like Tua was an eighth-round pick. (laughs) He was projected to be the number one overall pick until he got his his hip crushed. That's the only reason why he slid to five. I. I would say that if the previous regime is Nick Saban and whoever is offensive coordinator that made him get a bootstrap ankle surgery and come back in four weeks. You you get my point. My yes. point is uh, Brian Flores regime yeah. had to uh, crush his confidence. Yeah. Well, that's so, been reported. So like, I, I think it's nice to be able to say that Mike McDaniel did it, but you could also argue that he just got out of the way and he mm-hmm. stopped doing the things that was hindering him. So that, is the Tua specific point. But what doesn't change between Tua and any other of these quarterbacks is coming up is they are not 
operating in a way that would allow them to not pay him is my point. Yeah. So the decision point, when you get to the 11th hour, the decision is, do I go with this quarterback? I pay him what he wants or do I try to find another quarterback? And if you don't have a line on another quarterback, then I try to break it down in some sort of probabilities. You would say the probability that the guy that we had last year be great, the probability that he's going to be good, I don't know, 65 70%. The probability that you'll find someone else that can get you there, I don't know, 15 20 maybe? I mean, probably lower on yeah. both of them. Um, you the, think so? Yes. Um, I said that it'd be good, not that it repeat. You don't yeah. think that the probability is high that two will at least be good? I would say, I guess it's a coin flip of yeah. how many games they'll play in a, in a season. Um, no, I mean, here's the thing. It, to me, it's this is an opportunity cost conversation too. Yeah. One of the Dominique Foxworth show maxims is institutional stability mm-hmm. and situations defining a player's outcome in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Guys at the top of the draft are good. Yep. And they can get host. There are You're using my words against me. That's right. I right. I certainly am because that is an incredibly well run offense with a lot of pieces in a situation that if you think that there's a talented quarterback, there were five of them. Five of them drafted at the top of the draft this year. If you think that there's a talented quarterback who can recreate that stuff, that's the opportunity cost of paying him. Because why not take a shot on one of those guys? These are things like you got to remember the Jalen Hurts pick was crushed. Right. And then the Jalen Hurts contract, that's a contract that's going to continue to have implications on the Eagles if he's not the player that they thought he was um, with Shane Steichen two years ago. Like there are, there's, there's opportunity costs with these contracts. There's opportunity costs not moving off these quarterbacks. And particularly if you think you, this is almost how you build a team. If you think you have everything about the quarterback, there are mid-tier free agents. There's, I don't know the difference between Derek Carr and Tua Tunga Vailoa. I don't like those guys are available all the time. And if those guys are available in the draft too, that might be the situation where you take a shot. And this is two as a proxy for a lot of these mid-tier yeah. contracts. Yeah. So we can stop talking about him specifically, yeah. but I don't think that that the way that you view it is that you can create it with anybody. I don't think it's true. Who would you argue is the? That's how you view it. No, that's not how I view it. I think that there are uh, there's a level of quarterback that's good enough, and I think most teams land or most quarterbacks land somewhere that's not prepared for them, and things fall apart. They can't coach to their skills, and things fall apart. I think that what happened with Tua was he got in a situation with a coach that can make it work. Taking that risk with someone else, you still can get a quarterback that's not good. Like I, I'm not I'm me saying that the situation ruins a quarterback is not the same as me saying that any quarterback can thrive in a situation. Fair. So I I don't know. I think it's a. It seems like there are a couple different strategies. It seems everyone is following the same strategy. You think of Kyle Shanahan as the one coach that you might think could get the best out of any quarterback, and he wasn't able to do that in that one situation. They cycled through a <laughs> bunch of other quarterbacks that yeah they that it didn't work for. It seems clear that that guy's even looking for the quarterback. But my point is, if you want to try a different strategy, then you have to start that strategy before it's too late. And it seems like everyone waits till the end of the contract when they have no leverage and they have no alternatives. And then they want to pretend and try to negotiate down with a player where it's like, look, this guy has the leverage. Now he's going to go into the free market where someone is going to see what he did and say it's worth a shot, or you are going to throw away whatever championship hopes. Cause most of these teams, their quarterback was good enough to get them to a point where they feel like they're within their window. And the Dolphins, maybe they're right or maybe they're wrong, but they clearly last year were going after it. And they this year, I believe, they're going after it again. They feel like they're close to it again this year. And no one's making that decision at that point. No one has the the guts to be able to walk away and see what happens because that's how you get fired. Yeah, I mean, just walking away and tanking is is different or like making your team intentionally worse. It's the, the question would be, do you think you can approximate the value right. with a higher upside play over the long term? Um, that's the Falcons' decision. They signed Kirk Cousins to a contract and were still willing to take Michael Penix Jr. because it was they viewed it as the long-term play of streaming quarterbacks. Yeah, um, I love that decision. Yeah, that's that. Well, it got pilloried, but I defended that decision. Yeah, it got pilloried because it was you know they've uh, Terry Fontenot has not had the um, yeah. greatest foresight with, for the use of his top ten picks over the last. He's definitely um, drafts like he plays a lot of match. He drafts like me. It's great. <laughs> 
<laughs> Can I say one thing about this? By the way, and we'll get back to this. This is a small tangent. I watched some of the offseason hard knocks. I have never felt more connected to an NFL GM than watching them execute the Brian Burns trade. Oh, God. They were just like talking about it. What about throwing two first round picks here or whatever? Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't, it, it, did, it didn't feel calculated or it didn't feel, I didn't see it. No, it's like it felt like they were actually just like the way I would execute a fantasy football trade. <laughs> <laughs> they, do, they weren't like referring to some special calculations? Yeah, no. Definitely not. There were, at first, I was like, what if we traded Burns? And I was like, ha, ha, ha. No, seriously, what if we gave you two first-round picks? Jeez. Oh, uh, oh, we would take Burns. We would take. <laughs> it's like literally like when I offer you in my fantasy league, my my two, my two number two and three receiver, and be like, give me Christian McCaffrey. Are we going to have a show fantasy league? We, we could. All right. Just, as long as we gang up and decide to beat Mina, because if she beats us, I'll... Yeah. Who says she's invited to the fantasy league? No ringers. All right. Fine. Um, <laughs> so I got a question. Mm -hmm. Let's say you decide you can't win a Super Bowl with a guy. Mm -hmm. You're you're now pro management Foxworth, GM Foxworth. Okay. You need to figure out a path forward. Right. How can we improve the team or improve that position? Is your thought process that it's still fruitful to pl to pay the quarterback knowing that you actually, while it might hurt your cap, you maintain more flexibility by be, being decent, potentially having a trade asset, mm -hmm. developing players around the quarterback than it is to just let him walk. I get what you're saying. Um, you you make it sound much more reasonable than it feels to mm -hmm. me. Is And I can't ever be like fully pro-management box surf <laughs> because I am still thinking about... I mean, it's just the way... It's the way football kind of works. It's the way football players think. It's the way that football feels. Even from a week-to-week -week basis, it's not like in basketball or baseball where you kind of like accept that, oh, we're going to lose this game. We got another one in a night or two. Like football doesn't feel like that. Yeah. And it does season to season, it doesn't feel like that. And it shouldn't. Even if in the front office they're making some sort of uh, long-term strategic plan. I have a hard time imagining a world where I am not looking to be as good as I possibly can and letting a quarterback walk out of the door like your beloved Washington, um, I guess at the time, not the commanders, did with Kurt Cousins. They've been looking for a quarterback ever since. Hopefully they found it now, but I guess you would argue that... He did it, Joe. He got one. <laughs> we'll see. I guess... So this is like what cuts against the argument that you're making is like, all right, there was some opportunity cost had we signed Kirk Cousins. We could not go after a great quarterback. But in that stretch, like I know Kirk Cousins isn't the greatest, but Kirk Cousins has been good enough that if you put the right pieces around him, I think we all believe that you could win big with Kirk Cousins. You could make a run like you can do it with Matt Ryan. You can do it with some of these quarterbacks that yeah. aren't great. And this is an interesting thing. I'm not I'm 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 not going to be too literal. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you this cuz this is the that if you put the right pieces beside him. That's the key term in yeah. all of this. And the reason I say that is Kirk Cousins has been a very good quarterback in the NFL. Far above average. Yep. Uh, obviously, he has so much scar tissue around fourth quarter performances. It's jaded the way that we've seen them. Dak Prescott's probably a better quarterback than Kirk Cousins. He has a lot of scar tissue from not winning. His next contract is likely going to be, and his current contract as it having not being re-signed with the cap hit is really prohibitive of putting those right pieces around him. Right. Does that become a different opportunity cost when you literally have to look and be like, this guy's really good, but because of the contract he's earned, it's not saying he hasn't earned it right, or he right. wouldn't perform to it. We, knowing his skill set, he's not an elevator of certain talent around him. We can't build a winner despite the fact that he's really good. So what you're asking to me sounds like, are we going to optimize for the short term or the long term is like the way to think about that, I think, in a way that is more palatable to me, because I would never I'd have a hard time walking away from a good quarterback. But the argument is, if we accept this now, mm -hmm. then we go get somebody else and we start optimizing and we, we might end up landing on one of these all time great franchise lifters or we also might find a cheaper version of this guy yeah but it's still for me the we fear. also might have room to find right the 
defensive tackle is going to be the next John Randall, right. who is an undervalued asset who we're able to get with the 12th pick or something. And then that uh, ostensibly makes the quarterback position less important or the, the talent of his mm-hmm. quarter, quarterback position less important. I don't have that type of heart, I don't yeah. think. And like I, I think a lot of people like to think that they do, but really given that situation, the future, you've been a fan of a team that hasn't had quarterbacks. You should know. Oh, it's broken me. Yeah. I'm a like, loser. I, I would have a hard time having a quarterback getting up to go to work as a GM every day. And I got a quarterback that's like, all right, he's okay. I could do that. Getting up and going to work every day and thinking, I don't know, maybe this, maybe that. Like, uh, or knowing that the guy that we have stinks is puts me in a much less uh, happy mood. So I, I get the logic behind it. But also, like, we have to accept that coaches and general managers are thinking for job security. Yes, and we don't this. we don't have to in the media. We get to evaluate this and right. uh, evaluate this in the way that we think is best. Our yeah. job security is not tied to what we think these GMs should do. Right. Yeah. Um. Well, to be honest with you, the the right thing to probably do is to get as many chances as you can at the draft and hope that you land the special guy. Mm-hmm. But that. You know how I feel about that. And I think the evidence supports my feeling is that the special guys are partially made yeah. by the situation that they're in. None of these great quarterbacks came into terrible situations. And we point to Joe Burrow as one example. Burrow that, and Allen. Yeah. Peyton well, Manning. I mean, Josh Allen's situation wasn't bad, didn't they? Like, it was okay. They were like, they were like, the playoffs. Eight, but they were historic losers for a long time before. Yeah, but I mean, the situation they walked into yeah. with the players that were there and the coaches that were there, it was not a bad situation. No. And even quarterbacks that are a little bit more unconventional, like Lamar Jackson, landed in a great situation and turned out to be a two time MVP. Like, I think that that the logic follows, which is why people advocate for tanking. The logic follows that we got to keep playing the lottery until we hit. But I don't think that's how it actually works. Mm-hmm. I think you need to build a team and then roll people like Purdy. Purdy. The Purdy situation is going to be very interesting. Bill Barnwell, our beloved Bill. Love him. Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. He's on the ballot. He's okay. Yeah. okay. We'll, we'll, the voting will be after the season. Bill's on the ballot. Uh, potential. Foxworth Show Hall of Famer. Yeah, potential Hall of Famer. Uh, beloved friend. Football genius. True. Um, he wrote a piece on ESPN.com about what a Purdy contract could look like, particular, particularly with the cap rising. He could be in line for a three year or five year, $325 million deal. He's not eligible for that until after the uh, 2025 season or, in, or sorry, in 2025, the off season. He's put up preposterous numbers. He's won at a really high level. There are legitimate doubts about him. But I actually think beyond the quarterback performance part of it, this is the interesting thing of you've built everything perfectly. But then to pay that guy, you likely do have to take steps back in ways that other juggernaut rosters have as well. And we saw the downside of that with the Eagles. We saw that the Chiefs were able to thread the needle partially because Mahomes is one of the best players of all time. Maybe the best player of all Whatever. However you want to rank him. All right. And I actually think it's interesting that he's sort of the all-time litmus test for this type of thing because you have the coach. Yeah, You've built the situation perfectly. A lot of those guys are older, Mm -hmm. um, but it actually hasn't worked as well with Purdy. So I'm wondering in a situation like that, you've built the team. You've built this team largely because you're able to pay pay your quarterback $900,000 a year. Is that a situation? Even though, like, we're probably going to look up in week six and he's going to be the MVP favorite. (laughs) A tradition as old as time itself that you would consider... You pay that guy and you say, we figure it out. We can draft. We can replace. We're the 49ers. We can do what Howie Roseman does and find value and rebuild the roster on the fly. Or are you like, Kyle Shanahan can do this with anyone? You know what I'm going to say. You pay him. Yeah. You pay him. It seems so. The way that I would, uh, they try to trick us on, on get up every now and then to getting into an argument about whether a guy, whether you can build a roster around a guy making a bunch of money or not. And the way that I get out of that, particularly when I'm talking to Mike Tannenbaum, is you have been getting value from your quarterback up until now. He's made your job easy because he was performing the most important job at a price below his value. Mm -hmm. Now it's your turn, GM, to do your job. You need to provide value to the team by finding these diamonds in the rough. Because that's essentially, while we like to to trumpet how great Mahomes is and how he could win with anyone, 
or he could win in any situation. It doesn't matter who you surround him with. We got to be honest. They hit these picks. Their defense was one of the best in football last year, largely made up of guys on rookie deals. Like That's how you continue to, to build something. That's how you create a dynasty is by being able to draft and develop well. Yeah, or just, or just get your great goat quarterback to take last over and over again. Same, same thing. Have him marry a supermodel. <laughs> that, in this modern age, that is how you are able to. It's not like back in the day you could just keep all your players around and you have a dynasty. Or uh, in the NBA, you could at one point out outspend everyone and you have a dynasty in football at some point you're going to have to draft well and that's what's going to have to happen I like to point to that Broncos Super Bowl as an example the most recent Broncos Super Bowl win when Peyton Manning was playing quarterback I guess and like Von Miller was the best player and most important player on that defense they were play, paying Peyton Manning a uh, astronomical amount of money or percentage of the cap to be bad Mm -hmm. And they still won the Super Bowl because they hit on some draft picks and they hit particularly on one Hall of Famer that turned their defense into something terrifying. So that's what it comes down to. GM's got to do your job. Stop complaining about how you now finally have to pay somebody what they deserve and start finding this value. Stockpile draft picks, which is, looks like what the Bills are doing now, collecting draft picks because they know that Josh Allen's cap hit is going to make it difficult to build around him. And they're going to start taking shots in the draft and they're going to have to hit there. If you're the Cowboys, would you consider trading Dak? You could pay Parsons and CD. You could get a king's ransom of picks if you don't think that this this group can do it. Um, yeah, I would absolutely. I think that they should have paid him a long time ago. Yeah. And that's the, would, the original the thing we agree on vigorously is that yeah. pay pay people early. Yeah, they should have paid him a long time ago. They should have never gotten to a situation where he has a no trade, a no franchise clause, and he's in the last year of his contract with an enormous cap hit hanging over the franchise like that was mismanagement and at this point yeah i'd consider trading him in order to re-up that'd be the most classic jerry jones it would do, he would no, have to do jerry that yeah, no 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 because no, right. the, 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 the payoff is he would do that and draft shador sanders <laughs> <laughs> and as he rambles on the microphone comparing himself to Patrick Mahomes and say that his process is great. I saw some clips from his um, latest press conference. It seemed like he, was, he, he ain't all there, it feels like. <laughs> but, man, uh, I don't know. If I was a Cowboys fan, I'd be a little worried. I guess he doesn't make all the day-to-day -day decisions anymore about roster management and development. Should we run through a few NFL headlines and then some? I feel like we we got your thesis out there. Yeah, feel, yeah. See, I feel good about that. I feel, I feel good about out. it too. I like it. Everyone follow it or be a loser. Just so you know, I'm not a pro management shill. I was just helping clarify thoughts. Oh, um, you're telling me that? No, I'm telling the audience that. Okay, they don't care. <laughs> They're pro management too. <laughs> okay, they are. Um, not our fans. Fair point. Other NFL headlines. I want to get your your reaction to this. We'll get into a tiny bit of Olympic stuff. Jim Harbaugh. He is now the coach of the, I keep want to keep the LA Chargers. I want to say San Diego. Um, he was at camp today. And he said, "It feels like being born. It feels like coming out of a womb. It's comfortable, and then poof, you're born. The lights are on. People are looking at you." Dominique, would you be excited to play for this guy? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you thinking as a player? And you're, you're, he's talking about the comforts of his womb. I have no idea what it. <laughs> It seems like everyone who's played for him really likes him. He's a coach who has won at every, at every level, at every stop that he's been at. Um, him being weird would not scare me off. I think I'd like to play for a guy like that. There are plenty of other coaches who have plenty of other weird things. They just normally don't say him in front of microphones. So I guess he's a he's a more honest version of himself. So I'm a I'm a Jim fan, I guess. I kind of think you need a weird football coach. You do? Yeah. Football coaches are they're getting the, they're they're kind of getting too hot. Who? Oh yeah, I guess I was I was thinking about the most successful coaches, and they're all pretty weird. But uh, who are you thinking about? Do I have to list the hot coaches? Yeah. <laughs> coaches was it all, I should say they're all well manicured. Oh, like yeah. we have a whole generation of of yeah. McVay, Shanahan, um, uh, Lafleur, Dave, Dave Canales, Canales. Yeah, Dirty Dave. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I guess. And the best coaches are not not those ones. This, young, yeah. apparently, young women think Belichick's hot. <laughs> we got any more headlines? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great uh, transition. Uh -huh. uh, Kyle Shanahan wanted Bill Belichick uh, yeah, to be on his coaching staff. Mm -hmm. I have a, a, a couple questions. The first one: 
Shanahan is, you know, whether it's his coaching decision or whatever, he has struggled getting over the final hump of winning the actual Super Bowl. His heart has been broken. Would it have materially changed how much you trusted a 49ers playoff team if Bill Belichick is on the coaching staff? Um, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know that Bill Belichick could solve the problems that um, they had late in games, but I think you add him as a resource to any team and you don't have to do everything he says. But I think one of the, the more impressive things to have is someone who completely understands the ins and outs of schemes. And I think you can trust that Kyle Shanahan has a good grasp on all these schemes, especially attacking these schemes. But one of the best defensive minds in NFL history, having him on your team to help you from week to week, whether it's prepare to, to dismantle an opposing uh, defense or to help your defense prepare to take something away from the opposing offense. Like, I don't think that that hurts. That would definitely make me feel better about them. Do you think that would have been a good way for Bill Belichick to get another head coaching job? Absolutely. I mean, I guess Bill Belichick doesn't need that necessarily, but I, I found that it seems that it's harder to get back in than it is to, to move around. So uh, Bill Belichick probably is going to t have an opportunity to coach no matter where he goes. He doesn't need that, but generally you want to stay close to the game. I think when you're older and you're out of the game for a year – People think that it might have passed you by. Yeah. If he stays in the game, it makes him seem more. They won a Super Bowl with him as defensive coordinator. Oh, yeah. He'd be the first one hired. Well, he wouldn't be the defensive coordinator, I don't think, but as a uh, special assistant. I would have loved him to be like, how about I'm the head coach and Kyle, you're the OC. <laughs> you just run that off. You dial up those plays, play man. That goes back to a, a column I wrote a long time ago where I argued that we should be able to pay offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators more than a head coach in order to stay in that role. Yes. It's like if if uh, you're the best tackle in football, we don't decide that you're going to play quarterback. And with the skills that you need to be an offensive coordinator are very different from those of a head coach. So, like, I would love a situation where it seems like Bill Belichick is one of the best game managers or – that we've had and decision makers. I would love a situation where Bill Belichick could do that. And um, Kyle Shanahan could focus 100% on offense. It's so Logan Roy and Kendall Roy, if they were together on the sideline, you'd have both of them. Like Kyle already looks so much like, like Kendall <laughs> well, I Roy. Mean, what, uh, how is it Logan and Kendall? That's because, such an insult to Kyle. Because Bill Belichick would look at him in like the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl. Be like you got to be a killer Kyle. And you're not a killer. But Kyle, is an actually great coach. I know. Suggesting that he's Kendall Roy. It's just you just wanted to say you got to be a killer. And he uh, looks so much like Kendall he Roy. Does look like Kendall, but he's not Kendall. He's an actual. He's actually good at his job. And I mean, I guess the nepotism is. Uh, and Bill Belichick like is Logan Roy. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to get into some succession stuff, but right. I, I guess that um, Kyle Shanahan. I, I love. I, I'm a. I'm a. I'm a Shanahan stand. So yeah. I'm never going to give up on that. How could anyone not like Kyle Shanahan? Do you have less faith in Bryce Young bouncing? And I I feel so stupid even saying this. Less faith in Bryce Young having a bounce back season after seeing him walk into training camp. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Is, that is very stupid. Um, Yes, I do have less faith. He, he looks so small. No, um, I don't know. It's hard. You got to figure out how the backpack is just too big, <laughs> man. Like you had to know. Is, is he new to the Internet? I guess he doesn't care. He's just carrying a backpack walking in a training camp, but he's so small that the backpack is so big. It is a bad look. You've set yourself up. It doesn't change how much confidence I have in him. Maybe Dave Canales can figure out something with him the same way he did with the Baker Mayfield. He uh, is just, yeah, I mean, sort of the short quarterback whisperer, yeah. Dave Canales. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he just also like doesn't look that like broad. Yeah. He just looks really, really, really small. It, what... What happened to us? Because a quarterback like that would have never been as highly talented. And it, there's just so much groupthink in like the way that we do talent evaluation. Not to say that Bryce Young isn't talented and didn't deserve to be a high draft pick, but I think this is definitely an example of one sentiment becomes the the central one that no one wants to buck against because mm -hmm. there was a time when his size was disqualifying as a quarterback. Yeah. Even if you played well in college, there was a time when that was disqualifying as a quarterback. And it felt like no one was willing to – and I was a part of it also. I was like, yeah, Bryce is really good. He plays in SEC, and it doesn't seem to bother him. But it felt like no one or very few people 
were like, hey, you know what doesn't work in football? It's really thin, short guys. I mean, it's like we can thank Kyler, Russell Wilson, and Drew Brees, but he's even an outlier in how small he is compared to them. Yeah. But I thought that I remember the Kyle and um, Russell conversations leading up to Baker, but I guess maybe, yeah, but it felt like after Baker was drafted and didn't like become great, it felt like we all were like, oh, yeah, eh, that ain't it. But I mean, it's not an exact one to one situation because there was obviously Rosen and Darnold. But I I promise you they'd rather have the Baker Mayfield back over, pick back over Josh Allen and uh, Lamar Jackson. Like Lamar, uh, like Lamar obviously won the Heisman Trophy. He was right. the better college quarterback than Josh Allen. But it's crazy in theory to just look at a draft where you have a guy who's. 6'5", 260, right. who can run like a deer and throw the ball 90 yards, and you take Baker. Over. It's it's so funny how we are always fighting the previous war in these drafts because, like, that – I feel like the Josh Allen um, maturation landed us with Trey Lance yeah. as a draft pick, and I think that's it, – it probably happens in some ways where it's good, but I do think that some of those other experiences landed – them thinking that I guess I we, we can't give up on Bryce Young he might I mean be, Fields um, and Haskins is the reason that um you know CJ Stroud wasn't the number one overall pick yeah it was Ohio State's right seeming like a system quarterback where guys are running wide open and you're throwing the ball to Chris Olave Garrett Wilson Marvin Harrison Jr. Jackson Smith and Jigba and Jamison Williams and it's like how do we evaluate these quarterbacks <laughs> I guess Anthony Richardson is an example of following the Josh Allen strategy. Well, if he could stay healthy when he was yeah. healthy, he looked good. But following the Josh, Josh Allen strategy working, but goes back to the original point I was making. Yeah. I think the situation matters. And I think I, I think they're also just like there should be a threshold for these things where it's like maybe we took it a little bit too far with Trey Lance. He's thrown like way fewer passes than any freak athlete quarterback we've ever evaluated. We just don't have enough information to really evaluate him correctly. And Bryce Young is such an outlier, even from the small people where it's like, but the Trey Lance conversation, like as ridiculous as this sounds now, Mm -hmm. I feel like I could easy, I could more easily build an argument around drafting Trey Lance than I could around draft drafting Josh Allen was after Josh Allen was huge. part. Right. I know, but I'm saying that, Josh Allen was not great with a lot of film. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trey Lance had no film and had all the measurables. Like, obviously, the right answer there is Josh Allen, but it's just, I guess it just speaks to how this is an inexact science, which is why in the first part of this show I said, pay your quarterback if he's mediocre. (laughs) Just keep him. Don't get, don't get, um, yeah, don't get too creative. You guys aren't as smart as you think you are. <laughs> it's so funny. Ooh, it's like Trey Lance, like, it's a mystery box. We don't know if he sucks. <laughs> uh, of course. And uh, you you would always pick door number two. I, if you, is that, what's that? Let's make a deal where they're yeah. like, hey, you got a boat. Or what's behind door number two? Door number two. Is it's the, the family guy quote oh, yeah, that gets yeah, referenced. Yeah. It could even be a boat. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think Family Guy references. We are definitely washed. Dude, I'm so old. <laughs> Making Family Guy references. It's embarrassing for this show, but I understand. Yeah, it has to be done. What do young people reference? You know, Mean always references like memes, mm-hmm. which I I can't reference memes. I'm too old for that. It's like the 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 sweaty guy who's looking at two buttons, like the red yeah. button and the blue button. And it's like, <laughs> uh, draft five foot five Bryce Young. Draft Trey Lance, who has no film. <laughs> Just um draft Patrick Mahomes and you'll be fine. Yeah, just draft. I would have done. Just draft Patrick Mahomes or have a spine and draft Jalen Hurts while you still have Carson Wentz and be like, we don't have the guy. We got to keep cycling through. I love draft that. Michael Penix Jr. Um, let him cook. Do you want to speed run a couple Olympic headlines? I would love to. Okay, off the top, do you have an Olympic headline that's most interesting to you? Something you're looking forward to in this? I got to be honest. I'm pretty. I mean, I'm a little bit excited about seeing if we can overcome the twisties. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay. Did you read? Did you read about some of the details about this? No. They're fascinating. They're load managing her. So up until last year, they did not. We're talking about Simone Biles, the greatest gymnast of all time, who's coming back from the twisties. Who, um, the specifics of it are are fairly gruesome. It it came about from her repressing sexual traumas that happened to her that were sort of exposed in the Larry Nasser trial. Um, and she's presumably overcome them. She's starting to win again. She's a prohibitive favorite as the greatest gymnast of all time. But a huge part of it was 
she wasn't doing jumps. She wasn't doing things that could aggravate it for a really long time. And her, even her training for this, they're trying to manage her training to do as little as possible to potentially lower the likelihood of triggering something that could cause it again. That is exciting and a bit nerve wracking. I believe in her. I mean, she's great. She'll be great. I'm also really excited about speaking of great Victor Wimbanyama. I know I'm supposed mm-hmm. to say USA basketball. I mean, I guess there is some suspense with them because they've been not great in some of their lead up games. But I would rather if you made me choose between watching the Team USA and watching Victor Wimbanyama play. I would watch all the French games because I would like to see this version of Victor a year in the NBA uh, in a team where he is clearly the best player uh, with some good support around him, allowing him. Do you see him do the through the legs off the glass dunk as if he was on a kid's hoop? That dude's insane. Yeah. They lost four games in the run up to this, too. Did At they? home. Yeah. And they're oh. playing at home in the Paris Olympics. Um, but yeah, it's going to be super exciting. I mean, these are it's very rare that maybe the most exciting basketball player in the Olympics is not going to be from an American team. Um, Part of that is because a lot of these teams haven't been as good in the past. And when Spain had the Gasols, those, they weren't as exciting as our, as our guys. I know what you're excited about, but before we get to what you're excited about, I said that I'm not as excited about USA basketball, but I'm deep in USA basketball highlights and watching LeBron and Steph work together is so much fun. And when KD gets healthy and gets on the court, like watching the mismatches that they create is so much fun. I am very excited for KD to be back. We need like more mature basketball players who understand how to play within this team concept. Um, I couldn't agree. I mean, there's a bunch of other stories. Katie Ledecky, Mm -hmm. um, I think her trying to match Michael Phelps's gold medal count is pretty amazing. It's amazing, but I mean, I don't, I don't get all excited. I, I'm a land athlete guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, Ledecky's from this area too. Yeah. So good for her. Go Ledecky, but I want to watch Shakari. Shakari Richardson's yeah. a huge bounce back where... Win one for weed. <laughs> win one for weed. Also, it's, it's a actual like her time thing. Like her, I thought in 2020, the story obviously sucked. No, like the rule was the rule. No one wanted to see her not run. Right. Um, and now she's got, like a, I think, a better chance of winning it than she did four years ago. You know, four years ago, her PR would not have won the Olympics. Of course, that's not to say she couldn't have PR'd in the Olympics and won it. But this this seems like her time where she's been uh, a pseudo-dominant track performer heading into it. And can I tell you the one I'm most excited uh, about? I already know. Go ahead. So I was most excited about Nadal and Alcaraz playing doubles together in the Olympics. It's the idea of... Jordan and LeBron playing twos together <laughs> at the end of their career, uh, even in the hobbled state of Rafael Nadal. Nadal right now, uh, of course, he got injured again. He hurt his quad today in practice and had to stop practicing, and now it's in doubt. But assuming he does play, I'm much more excited for the singles. On Philip Chatrier, a stadium with his statue outside because he's won 14 French Opens there, 14 Roland Garros. In the second round, He's drawing Novak Djokovic. <laughs> These are the two most bitter rivals in the sport. They have played 59 times over the course of their career. 59. Djokovic is, is leading 30 to 29. They will likely never play again. And on this surface, this slow clay court, even in this diminished state, the idea of playing Rafael Nadal on clay, there's been no surer bet in sports over the last 15 years than him on that red clay in that stadium. And he is a lunatic. He will play till his legs fall off if he has to, to beat Djokovic and tie it 30-30 in their rivalry. We're Team Alcaraz, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Team Just Carlos. Sure that we, are, we are rooting for King Los. I am a fan, his athleticism. I knew you were going to say that. Um, Jimmer Fredette, you got any love for Jimmer Fredette in a three-on-three? Any? I'm happy for Jimmer. Yeah, you don't, you're not going to watch it, though? No. Um, by the way, I f***ed up one thing. Uh, Kate, Kate, Katie Ledecky can't tie Phelps' gold medal count. She can... For Pete, like Phelps did. He'll uh-huh. be the first athlete since that. So, apologies. I'm also looking forward to watching 30 seconds of breakdancing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to lean in on breakdancing, but I'm watching 30 seconds. Of it. And I'm looking forward to 2028 to watch flag football in the Olympics. Can't wait. I can't wait to play in it. <laughs> get in shape. Strengthen these quads and get, get active. All right. Wrap it up. Yep. All right, Charlie. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Thanks to all the great producers. Megan Serafina, Brian, Kevin, and Tez. And I love you, Podville. We out. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.